people away from God while the righteous ones tried to bring them back. However, as a whole, the nation fell into deep sin and became rebellious towards God. Because this God sent prophets over and over again trying to warn the people of Judah, you know, that they needed to repent. One major prophet at that time was Jeremiah. You know, he came in proclaiming that they were going to be taken captive by Babylon. He was mocked. He was scorned. The people didn't want to listen to him. They listened to the false prophets and said they did not repent, and his prophecies came to fruition in the years between 606 and 586 B.C., when three different invasions from Babylon led to their captivity and the city was finally destroyed. However, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, God says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you, and causing you to return to this place. And then in 539 B.C., there was uh, King Cyrus II of the Medes and the Persians. He came in and he conquered Babylon. And in the book of Ezra, we learn that it is decreed that the Jewish people would be allowed to go back and rebuild their city. The Jewish people returned to Judah under the leadership of Zer, Zer, ah, Zerubbabel and Jeshua, and they began to rebuild. And there were some setbacks that you can go through and read in the book of Haggai about where the people weren't actually following and doing what they needed to be doing there. But by 515 B.C., the temple was restored. And while they did rebuild the temple of the Lord, the city, it was not entirely rebuilt. And this is where Nehemiah comes in. Around approximately 445 B.C., nearly 100 years after the end of the exile, Nehemiah was called to finish building the walls of Jerusalem for the protection of the people, and he did just that. In Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, tells us, So the wall was finished in the 20 and 50th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and two days. And it came to pass when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were must catch down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. So Nehemiah here, he went and he did a great work for the Lord. That's what I want to talk about today, because I think we can learn a lot from Nehemiah's experience here and what he went through in order to accomplish this great work for the Lord. You know, I'm pretty positive you're probably not going to be called in your life to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem anytime soon, right? But there's other great works for the Lord that you can do. You know, maybe you're thinking about becoming a missionary. Maybe you're thinking about starting a ministry through the church, teaching a Sunday school class. Maybe expanding what you're already doing. Taking on a big project to help those that are less fortunate in the community. Or maybe you're just wanting to spread the gospel, right? All of these things are great works that you can do for the Lord. So let's take a look through the book of Nehemiah here. And let's start at the beginning. So I'm going to turn my Bible here back to the very beginning of Nehemiah. And we're going to work through kind of chapters 1 through 6 and stopping at different points along the way. And we're going to learn from Nehemiah on what we can do in different things when we want to do a great work for the Lord. The first thing I noticed was that Nehemiah recognized the opportunity that was put in front of him. In chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the Bible reads, Then Hanai, one of my brethren, came, and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So Nehemiah here was being a cupbearer for a king, Archimedes, living in Persia in the Shushan Palace. And it was probably just a normal day for him. Right? He was just going about his business when he received a visit from his brother. Right? About this opportunity. We never know when those opportunities are going to come. They can just come out of the blue any day on a normal day. I'm sure it was probably just a normal day for Moses when he was out taking care of his sheep when he came across that burning bush on the desert. It was a, probably a normal day for Peter, Andrew, James, and John when they're getting off their boat fishing when Jesus approached them and called them to be fishers of men, right? You never, never know what a day will bring, what kind of opportunities God will put in front of you, right? That's why we always need to be awake, be prepared, be ready to answer those opportunities, Right, And the more you care about people and the more you kind of go looking for opportunities, the more opportunities you're going to see. What did Nehemiah do here? He asked about the brethren there in Jerusalem, right? He cared about them. He wanted to know. 
Do you care like Nehemiah? Do you ask questions? Do you try to understand situations? Do you go looking for opportunities to help? Right? But recognizing the opportunity, once something we see that opportunity, that, that's just the beginning. It, after we recognize it, I notice there's three things that, that Nehemiah did here that we should also do when we recognize opportunities that are put in front of us. The first thing that he did, he, he prayed. In chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible reads, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I'm sure here he was asking for guidance, right? This opportunity is put in front of him. He sees a need. Is he going to be the one that's going to fulfill that need? He's asking God, you know, probably, is it my will? Is it your will in my life that I go and do this, right? We always want to make sure we're praying and acting in the will of God because sometimes it's easy to overwhelm ourselves. We can take too much onto ourselves. So we want to ask God certain questions, you know, when these opportunities are presented in front of us. Is this what you want me to do, God? Is this going to take time away from my family? Right? God wants us to take care of our family. That's a strong, important calling in our lives, right? But we want to ask God, you know, I see this need. Is it going to affect my family life? Is it going to cause me to lose focus on my personal relationship with you if I'm going to take it on? God, do you really want me to go do this? Or am I, am I trying to do this because I want to start pleasing men instead of you, Lord? Am I trying to do this to get seen in the sight of other men, right? We do things sometimes out of a wrong motive, right? So we want to pray to God and ask him, am I viewing this opportunity, God, as a chance to glorify you? Am I doing this for your glory and honor, or am I doing it for my own glory and honor? Am I trying to raise my own reputation here? Pray that God humbles us if that's the task that he wants us to do, right? Follow the warning in Jesus that he gave in Matthew chapter 6, right? Jesus tells his disciples, he says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand is doeth. Right? So ask for God's guidance. Pray. Say, God, why am I doing this? Why have you put this opportunity? Is this really for me? Or is it for someone else? You know, and this is a big deal. It's a very important first step. Something you want to take your time with. You just don't want to rush in to decisions. You know, you want to take your time, especially if it is a big decision. And because it says here, I sat down and mourned and wept certain days and prayed and fasted. This is not something Nehemiah took lightly. He wanted to make sure that he was going to be acting in the will of God. You want to be sure you're acting in God's will because of what the next step is, right? So once you've prayed and you've asked God for his will and, and you've discerned and you believe that, you know, this is God's will for your life, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to make it a priority, right? When God calls you to do something and you've prayed and came to that conclusion, it needs to be the number one thing in your life, right? But the devil, though, the devil's going to work through our flesh, and he's going to try to work against that. He's going to start to try to make you doubt and try to make you worry and have anxiety and making that this great work of priority, right? He's going to say things in your head like, you know, I'm so busy, you know, I, I, I don't got time to get prepared to that, to teach that Sunday school class. I got too much other stuff going in my life. I have too many responsibilities to my friends and my family. They depend on me around here. I don't know, you know, you know, Lord, I know you say it's my will, but I, I just can't do it. We begin to make excuses, right? And I say things like, I would do that bus route, or I would go door knocking on such and such days, but that's the days that my in-laws or my parents had me come around to help them with this and that. I just can't do it, Lord. My job, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too important to my work, Lord. I can't take the days off like that. You know, I got other stuff I need to get done. So we begin to make excuses. Right? We begin to say, yes, Lord, I get it. I believe you're calling me, and I will do that for you, but not now. Right? Let me take on these other things first. Let me go and finish this, and then I'll get to this great work that you're calling me to do. You know, but what does Jesus tell us? In Luke Chapter 9, Jesus says, And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. 
If you have prayed and you truly believe that the work you're going to do is a calling for God, that God is calling you to do that, you need to go at it wholeheartedly. You need to trust God. It's your number one priority. He knows the needs of the others in your life. He knows the work needs. He knows the family needs. He knows the other responsibilities that you have. He'll take care of it. Our God is a provider. He's not going to call you to do something that's going to cause harm in other parts of your life. He sees the big picture, sometimes that we don't always see, right? He knows the needs of all. It's our job to be obedient to his calling. And that's what Nehemiah did here, right? Here he was the king of Persia's cupbearer. It might just kind of sound like a lowly position, but, you know, the cupbearer is pretty important to the king. What did the cupbearer do? He tasted the wine. He tasted the food to make sure it wasn't poison, right? He was always with the king. He was kind of the face of the, the kingship there, right? Always standing right next to the king. So he had to be well-spoken. He had to have a, a great reputation. He had to be knowledgeable. The king would use him for advice. So it couldn't be an easy task, right, for Nehemiah to go to this king who wasn't even a Jewish person and, 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 and ask him to leave. But that's exactly what Nehemiah did. He was making it a priority in his life. In chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, the Bible reads, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make thy request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Notice here, Nehemiah went back to that first step too. He was making it a priority. When he's getting ready to talk to the king about it, he prayed again. Just maybe one last time to make sure God really is this your will. Right? And he said unto the king, verse 5, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, and that I may build it. Right? You see, Nehemiah made the calling of God a priority in his life. He wasn't worried about what was going to happen with the king, what happened with the job. He was going to leave his job, his entire life behind, and do what God had called him to do. And he got the blessing of the king. When it's the true will of God working to do this great work in your life, you're going to get the blessings of the people around you. They're going to allow you to do this work, and they're going to be understanding. So after we prayed, you know, we made it a priority. Third thing that Nehemiah did here with this opportunity was that he planned. Right? This is a quote attributed to Benjamin Franklin. He says, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Right? We plan for everything in our lives. And right after Nehemiah asked the king, that's the first thing he did. He started making preparations for his journey. In chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, after he asked the king and the king has granted him permission, Nehemiah says, Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me in, over until I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. See what Nehemiah did here? He immediately started making plans so he'd have safe travels, so he could get to that work site, so he could show up at the place where God had called him to do this work. He was also ensuring that he'd have the materials ready, right? We also need to be prepared mentally with the knowledge needed to complete the task. Right? I think about how many people here would get ready to go out and build a house somewhere, right, and not have a blueprint for it? Just show up out there with an empty plot of land, right, and say, all right, here, let's go. Let's, let's build a house, right? No. You have the blueprint. You would want to know what you were doing. But maybe you have the blueprint, but what if you couldn't read it? It's not very helpful either, is it? No, you've got to be prepared. You need to know how to use that. But what if you had the blueprint and you could read it, but you had no idea where a lumber store was? You're going to get none of your material, Right? You're not going to accomplish anything. Same thing, what if you're going to rebuild an engine in a car, right? I would want to make sure I had a garage to work in. I had a place to go, right, and I knew how to get there. I want to make sure I had the proper tools. And it would probably also help if I knew a little bit about combustion engines before I started getting in there and taking all the bolts out and stuff like that. Or, or my work is not going to succeed. Or ladies, how many of you fired up the oven last Tuesday to bake us a pie for our pie and praise night? without knowing what you were going to put into it. You're just thinking, I'll just go to the fridge and grab whatever I can out of there, and I'll throw it all together, and it'll be great, right? No, you prepared. You went to the grocery store. You had your ingredients. You had your recipe ready. You knew what you were going to do beforehand, right? And that's just the big picture, though, of planning, right? 
We're going to take that whole idea, and we're going to have to put the big picture in place, but the next part of planning is we need to figure out how we're going to execute that plan, right? Because one thing we know is that plans don't always go as planned. Things, something is always going to come up that's going to get in our way. There's going to be obstacles, things that we did not expect, things that we have to work through. Nehemiah took his big plan, and he traveled to Jerusalem. And he was there three days, and I believe that's what he was doing. He was learning, he was looking around, and he was trying to figure out a way to execute his plan. In chapter 2, verses 13, and four, 13 through 15, the Bible reads, Nehemiah said, I went out by night, by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, but there was no place for beasts that was under me to pass. Then I went up to the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. Nehemiah was surveying the work site here. You know, he was figuring out a way that he was going to ex execute this plan, the plan to rebuild the walls. What was he asking himself while he was looking there? He's probably saying, hey, is this feasible? Right? How am I going to go about this? Where should I start? When I get all these materials, where do I need to place the materials, right? How many people am I going to need to take to accomplish this? He was getting everything set in his mind. And notice that he, when he was doing this, he did this all alone. He had not yet told anyone what his purpose was. And in verse 16 it says, And the rulers knew not whether I went or what I did, neither has I yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. I think he was trying to get his ideas in place, right? He wanted to make sure he had a solid plan. He wanted to know something that could be executed, something that could be accomplished, right? He was making sure, laying everything out for this opportunity because he wanted it to go well. When we're doing a great work for the Lord, that's what we want to do too. We want to look over everything and make sure that we know what we're doing. We have a great plan. And then he told everybody else. Right? Because we need counsel. We need other people's opinions on it. We can't be a solo ranger on it and try to do everything on our own. Proverbs 15, 22 tells us, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multiple of counselors, they are established. Right? So once we have a plan, we have a purpose. Right? We need to get other people's ideas on it because that's what it says. Without counsels, our purposes are going to be disappointed. We're going to fail. Right? But the multitude of counselors will help us fulfill our purposes. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did whenever he had his plan put fully in place. In verses 17 through 18 of chapter 2, Then I said unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the walls of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, and also the king's word that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. So he got the people behind him. He got their counsel. They agreed. This was a good work for God. And now they were ready to go and execute their plan. Right? So Nehemiah here, he recognized his opportunity. He prayed about it. Made it a priority. Set the plans to make it happen. And as part of, part of his plans, I'm hoping and I'm praying that he did, and I'm sure that he did, he took into consideration the second point of doing the great work of God that I noticed here, is that anytime you set out to do something great for God, you're going to face some opposition, right? The devil's not going to want us to succeed in that good work that we're trying to do. He's going to use people, our own emotions, anything he can that will try to stop us, right? And when he's using other people, it's usually going to follow the kind of the same pattern that I noticed that was displayed here in Nehemiah. The first thing that people are going to do when they want to try to stop you from doing something, they're going to tease you. They're going to make fun of you. Right? If you read chapter 2 and verse 19, but when San Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you, re would you, you, ah, will you rebel against the king? Right? They're saying, what do you guys think you're doing? 
You think you can just walk on in here, rebuild this wall? You guys don't have a chance. Are you, what are you, you're trying to rebel against the king? You're foolish, right? But they started that wall anyway. They had a plan. They were going to execute it. They didn't let the teasing get to them. Chapter 3 talks about how many people joined in. We're not going to read any verses from chapter 3, but that's just name after name after name saying how despite this teasing here at the beginning, they went to work. They kept going at it. And we flip over to chapter 4, we see that this didn't stop, you know, the opposition from teasing. Chapter 4, verse 1, but it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth, and he took great indignation, and he mocked the Jews. Mocked. He teased them. He laughed at them in a scornful manner. Verse 2 and 3, and he spake before his brethren of the army of Samaria and said, what will these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap or the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was with them, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. What are they saying here? Yeah, your wall's weak. What are you doing? You can't rebuild the wall out of this rubbish. I'm told you, you guys are foolish, right? It's going to be so weak that a fox will be able to climb up that thing and knock it down. They're being bullies here, Right? Teasing, that's, that's what bullies do. That's what bullies do when they're confused and they don't understand what's going on. Right? Things aren't going their way. So they decide they need to go out and poke fun at you. They need to make fun of what you're doing in order to make themselves feel better. And being teased or mocked, it, it's not fun. You know? I'm sure we, all of us have been teased at some point in our life. I, know it, I remember being teased as a little kid. And it stuck with me even to this day. You know, I get over it. But I always get teased about how big my ears were. I had a small head, I guess. I finally grew into my ears. But they'd call me Dumbo. And they'd be like, hey, you're just going to flap your ears and fly away. Look at you, big-eared guy. What does that do? It makes you want to isolate yourself. It makes you want to stay out of the public view. It makes you not want to be around people. Right? It hurts. It's painful. You know, it made me cry. I can remember times as a kid coming to tears because kids were teasing me about the size of my ear. You know, and when this happens, we probably all heard that advice that was given to me, right? Ignore them. It's easier said than done. We hear that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, you know, that saying, it's not entirely true, because the Bible tells us words do hurt, right? And words can be powerful. But it's only words for those that are close to us, right? When it's the opposition, when it's those that we are not friends with, those that don't matter to us, those words, we can't allow them to hurt us. It's a mind over matter thing, right? If we don't mind what they're saying, they do not matter in our lives, right? It's easy to ignore someone when they are opposing us. We need to take on that attitude. And when we start to ignore them, you know, people are going to say, hey, my teasing is not working. Right. It, didn't, it didn't work on Nehemiah and the people building this wall, right? They kept on working. And when they see that their teasing is not working, they're going to move on to the second thing that uh, this opposition, these boys are going to try to do, right? Next, they're going to try to threaten you next. In, cha in uh, chapter 4, starting off in verse 7, But it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being made up and that the breaches were began to be stopped, then they were wroth. And they conspired all of them to come together and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Moving down to verse 11. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause their work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places which shall return unto you, they will be upon you. So they started throwing threats out there like bullies do. Threats. Meant to intimidate them, to strike fear in the mind of the people, the person that they're directing these threats at, to change a behavior, something that's unpleasant, right? They don't want you to do this anymore. The teasing didn't work, so don't let me threat you. Let me threaten you. But God, he didn't give us a spirit of fear, right? Jesus tells us in Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. 
right? So we can ignore those threats of those bullies. And while we are being threatened, you know, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to be prepared to defend ourselves if necessary. But also it's important to realize that, that most threats are just bluffs, right? It's just a person who is weak, a person who is losing control, a person who is not getting their way, trying to regain it back. They're trying to make you scared to change behavior. A person that is constantly threatening is actually a very, very weak person. To kind of illustrate this, I think like sometimes I know this may not be a threat to us, but you ever been in Walmart and you've seen just a kid just behaving unruly and going crazy? And the mom or the dad saying, hey, you be quiet or I'm going to take you out. I'm going to take you out to the car and I'm going to beat your butt. Or I'm going to come take that toy away. And they're constantly just telling them, you do this and you do this. And they're threat after threat after threat. But that kid doesn't listen. That kid doesn't care. Right? Because those threats are just bluffs. It's not changing the kid's behavior. They know there's just empty threats there. But you see a person who's in good control of their kids, the kids that are well-behaved, do they need to make any threats towards their children? No. Those children know. Sometimes it just takes a look. Right? Because those people are strong. They're in control. They don't need to threaten their children because they stand by principles. And when we're doing a great work for the ward, like Nehemiah was, God is in control. He's called us to do that, right? And all, all those that oppose us can do is offer empty threats because they have no power, no control over what's going on. And we need not be afraid. But they're going to threaten, and they're going to try hard. And when those threats don't work, they're going to move on to the last thing that Sanballat and Tobiah tried here, their, their last attempt to try to oppose us. They're going to try to trick you, right? Flip over to chapter 6. Verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem said unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. Right? Your enemies are going to say, Hey, all right, I see it. I see what you're doing now. Let's, let's just get together. Let's meet. Let's talk it out. Let's figure it out. Let's, let's try to get to some compromise. Right? Their, their teasing didn't stop you. Their threats didn't stop you. So, hey, let's be friends now. Right? Let's go ahead. Let's meet up. Right? But that's not what they want. They don't want to be friends. They don't want to work together with us. What they want to do is get you alone to cause mischief. Right? As it says here, but they thought to do me mischief. And they'll be relentless with it. Right? They tried four times here. In verse 4 says, Yet they sent unto me four times after the sword, and I answered the same manner each time. Nehemiah said, No, you know, I, I have work to do. I don't have time to meet with you. And that didn't work, right? So then what they do then? Well, then they try to trick them with lies. In verses 5 and 6, Then some bought his servant, sent his servant unto me in a like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein it was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou the Jews thinkest to, re to re rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that they mayest be their king according to these words. Right? They actually went back a step here. They went back and reverted back to threats. Right? They tried to trick him again to come out. He wouldn't come out, so they started threatening him again, started making up lies. Now they're going to try to trick him. They're going to try to trick the people around you. They're going to make up lies about you, say evil things about you that aren't true to get you to be afraid to cause you to change your behavior. You know, they might even recruit those that are near to you to get in with that trickery, right? And or, or try to get you to slip up, to behave in a manner of fear. They will act like they are trying to protect you, but all the while they have other intentions. Look what happened in Nehemiah there in verses 10 and 12 here. It says, Afterward I came into the house of Shehemiah, the son of Delilah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut up, and he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of thy temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. Chapter 12, or verse 12. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. 
So they took someone that was close to Nehemiah, and they tried to trick him to get him to do something that was ungodly, to act in a manner that wasn't what he was sent for, to act in a manner of fear, right? That was what opposed us. That's what they're going to do. Trickery, threats, and teasing. It's all going to come at us. That didn't work on Nehemiah. Because we've already read the ending, right? We already know what happens at the end. They built that wall. It got finished. The wall and the great work that they were doing for the Lord, it was completed in 52 days. So the last thing we can take away is, right, well, how did they overcome all this stuff? It's the third and final point, right? They had an opportunity. They faced opposition. And finally, they overcame. How did they do that? Well, first, they trusted in the Lord, right? They never faltered. Remember, Nehemiah had prayed. He was sure. He took that first step. He was sure this was the will of God. And he had the trust that the Lord was going to take care of him through all of this. Chapter 2 is when that opposition first came, right? They started teasing him. They started saying, hey, you're foolish. You can't do this. I don't even know why you're trying to do this. What did, what did Nehemiah respond to him? In uh, chapter 2, verse 20, when they first started teasing him, Nehemiah said, Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. Right? So we were getting teased. He said, our God's going to provide. Our God is going to make sure this happens. You have no power here. So what did they do? They started threatening him. Right? That was that second step. How did they respond to the threats? In chapter 4, verse 19, And I said unto the nobles and unto the rulers and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large. And we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. And what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye tither unto us, our God shall fight for us. Right? When the threats came, Nehemiah, again, he kept his trust in the Lord. He said, our God is going to take care of us. What amazing faith and trust that Nehemiah had. Right? We should be the same when we're trying to do our great work for God. Romans 8.31 tells us, if God be for us, who can be against us? Right? So that is what we need to do. Keep trusting in the Lord. The second thing that Nehemiah and his group here did, they had teamwork and they had toughness. Right? They were not intimidated by the threats of their enemies. You know, they stood their ground. Also, kept their focus while protecting themselves from the threats. Before the service started, we were looking at the, kind of the title that Aaron made for me. And Jonathan's like, wow, is that an axe there? But they got building the wall. Yeah, that's what they did, right? They armed themselves. They were tough. They let them know that, hey, your threats are not going to cause us fear. We're going to stand tough. We're going to stand strong. And we're going to stand as a team together against you. And we're going to accomplish this work. In chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. And it came to pass, when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. Right? Showing toughness, bravery, courage, return to the work. And it came to the pass from that time forth that half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears and the shields and the bows, and the habergeons and the rulers were behind the house of Judah. So half of them were out there doing the work. The other half was being their teammates, standing there beside them, holding the spears, ready to fight when somebody came. But it just wasn't those people, not just half of them, right? They were all ready. They were all being tough. Because verse 17 says, They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid, every one with his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. They looked out for each other. Their strength in numbers, right? When we're going to do a great work for the Lord, we don't need to go it alone. We need to have a team with us. We need to trust our team. As it says in Ecclesiastes, in chapter 4, verse 12, that if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, right? A threefold cord is not quickly broken. We are brothers and sisters in Christ are there for our protection, there for our help, there that we can trust in them as we're trusting in God. But not only did they trust God, they had teamwork and toughness. Last thing Nehemiah did, he was true to God, right? He didn't change his behavior. He never questioned God. He always behaved in a godly manner. 
Well, they, they were there to protect themselves, right? They never went out and provoked a fight. They weren't looking for trouble. They were just looking to do what God had called them to do. They did not return railing for railing, right? When they got teased, when they were mocked, they didn't return it by teasing and mocking those that were teasing them. They just kept their mouth shut, did their work, did what God was calling them to do. They ignored the teasing and the evil of speaking against them, focused on their job. At the end, when they were trying to trick Nehemiah, he didn't give in to the fear, right? Remember when his friend told him to flee the temple so he could save his life? Nehemiah knew that that was wrong. He refrained from it. Chapter 6, verse 13 but it's therefore he was hired that I should be afraid and do so or go to the temple and sin. And that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. Right? That trickery. That's what they were trying to get Nehemiah to do. Try to get him to sin, to run to the temple, to blaspheme God, to act in a way that was improper with God's calling. But Nehemiah stayed, stayed true to his God, stayed true to his faith, stayed true to his principles. And that brings us full circle in this story, right? Brings us right back to where we started with in 15 and 6, in uh, verses 15 and 16, where the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month of Elul in 50 and 2 days. Something that in over 100 years had not been able to accomplish. Nehemiah did a great work for the Lord in 52 days by following those principles. And I hope this message can be helpful to you when you think about what you're going to do for the Lord. When you think about what kind of great work can I do, you know, be awake. Look for those opportunities when they're presented to you. Go looking for opportunities. And when you see an opportunity, pray about it and discover, you know, is this opportunity for me? Is this something God wants me to do? Is it God's will for me to take this on in my life? And if so, make it a priority. Hold nothing back. Go after it wholeheartedly and plan how you're going to accomplish it and make it happen. But know the whole time while you're doing this, there's going to be people that oppose you out there, right? There's going to be people that tease you. They mock Jesus. They're going to mock you when you're doing a work for Jesus. They're even going to try to threaten you. They're going to try to trick you, anything to stop you. But when you put your trust in the Lord and you stand strong and tough with your fellow Christians and you stay true to the word of God, you too can accomplish the great task that God has given you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this wonderful lesson in the book of Nehemiah on how we can go out, Lord, and accomplish a great task for you. I pray that the people in this room, you know, take it to heart, Lord, and start thinking about what kind of work can I do for you, Lord? What can I do for you to glorify your name and not myself? I pray as we go into the morning service, Lord, that you keep your spirit filled in this room, that you fill pastor with your spirit, and that he preaches a message and that will edify us, that will... Help us grow closer to you, Lord. And if there's anyone here that doesn't know your saving power, I pray that they may come to know you today. As we go into our song service, we want to do it all with your glory and honor in mind. So please just help us to praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.